Well, we're going to start chapter 15 today. As I said, we've just finished our discussion of equilibrium chemistry, and chapter 15, while it's entitled Acids and Bases and Their Equilibria, is a direct follow-up of equilibrium chemistry. Before we get to some of the equilibrium topics, though, I'm going to give you an introduction to acids and bases and what they are. I handed out a, a sheet, uh, and it's available online for, for the class watching online, uh, the notes today. And so as we go through the lecture, I'll refer to that sheet periodically, uh, just so you, so you know what I'm talking about. At the top of that sheet, you have some information about basic properties of acids and bases. We won't be, uh, I won't be testing you on these specific topics, like the fact that acids tend to taste sour, bases tend to have a bitter flavor to them when they're present in foods, all right? But it's good for you to have knowledge of where you encounter things like acids and bases in your everyday lives. So acids are very prominent in food. They're a flavor additive in a lot of the foods that you probably enjoy because of that tart taste that they impart to a food. Uh, bases are mostly prominent in cleaning products that you would encounter, like to, to clean your house, as it turns out. So these are things that are definitely uh, in, your, in your lives. Okay. Now there are three different definitions of acids and bases. Right? Uh, that's a bit of a problem for us as, a, as chemists, because we have to agree to which definition we're using when we want to work with acids and bases. The first definition of acids and bases were called the Arrhenius acids and bases. Arrhenius acids were compounds that were said to increase the hydrogen ion content of water when they were added to water. So when you would add a, uh, a compound to water, and it would increase the amount of this H plus ion, which is going to be very important uh, to all of our studies of acids and bases. Whereas Arrhenius bases were compounds that increase the OH minus content of water, all right? The hydroxide ion, as it's uh, commonly referred to. Now, a bit of a spoiler alert here. There's a key here. H plus and OH minus, if you put them together, give you water. And so much of our study of acid-base chemistry is centered on water what happens in water, and we're looking at really the two different pieces if you broke one of the hydrogen-oxygen bonds in a water molecule. One side we would call the acid, and the other side we would call the base, the <coughs> OH minus. Okay? Unfortunately, these are very narrow definitions, all right? and they limited the number of compounds that would be considered acids or bases. Acids were, uh, under this definition, acids were things like HCl, H2SO4, uh, HBr, some things that we are familiar with, but bases were only sodium hydroxide, for example, uh, potassium hydroxide, uh, uh, lithium oxide, Li2O. There was a very small group of hydroxide and oxide compounds that were capable of increasing the OH content in water. Okay. So that was our original definitions of acids and bases. That uh, has stuck around, but now been expanded into the most, today, the most commonly used definition, and the one that we will use in practice the most in this course. The third definition we won't get to until the end of this chapter. Okay? But the, our, our current definition of acids and bases are what are called the Bronsted-Lowry. I think one of the 
O's here. Okay. The, this definition was sort of uh, simultaneously proposed by two different scientists, and so that, that's why there's two names here uh, for Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases. Okay. Uh, a Bronsted-Lowry acid are substances that donate protons to other substances. And bases are going to be substances that accept protons. Oh, I left out a big word here. Donate. Okay, I said it, but that donate protons to other substances. Bases are substances that accept protons from others. Substances. Okay. So if you read this definition carefully, there's a, a subtlety to it. A compound, if this pen were a compound, I can't label this compound in my hand as an acid or a base until I see what it does with regard to protons, donate or accept. So, in the Bronsted-Lowry system, one of the subtleties is acids and bases are really about the behavior of compounds. As opposed to an absolute identity, like we would define something as an ionic compound or a molecular compound, right? So it's more how something behaves. And behavior is always subject to change depending on the surroundings. Okay. Uh, a, a great example is everyone in class is usually pretty quiet and attentive, all right? But uh, if you are out at you know, a sporting event uh, watching that, you might be much louder as you cheered on and watched the sports team play. Okay? Or if you're out at a party on a weekend or something. Again, your, your behavior changes depending on your surroundings and what's acceptable in those circumstances. All right? So, uh, so for acids and bases, we need to observe that behavior. The other subtlety that's implied here is in order for something to act like an acid, my pen wanted to act like an acid, I need something else that was willing to act as a base. If it wants to give away a proton, and we consider the cap to be a proton, something has to accept the cap. There has to be something willing to take it. If it can't complete the transaction, we cannot call it an acid, in other words. Right? So these two are really in relationship to one another, and you must have a base in order for something to act like an acid, or conversely, you must have an acid present if something wants to act like a base. All right. Any questions so far on uh, the, late, the, the names for acids and bases? Now, the term proton is a little tricky. When, when I say protons, where do you, what do you usually think of? What do we associate, in other words, protons with? Things that we've learned to this point. The nucleus of the atom. Right, the nucleus of the atom is what he said. And that's perfectly reasonable to think of the nucleus of the atom. That's where the protons and neutrons are held in an in a, in atom. And what is one of the major rules that we learned about protons in, in chemistry one? Anybody remember anything about the number of protons that an element has in its nucleus? Okay. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons that an atom has. Okay. 
So carbon, for example, is atomic number six, and it has six protons in its nucleus. <coughs> is carbon able to gain or lose any of those protons? No. That is what defines carbon. If we somehow slammed an extra proton into the nucleus of carbon, it would now be nitrogen, because that's how we define the elements of the periodic table. Right? So the definition that I've just given you should sound uh, impossible. All right? Things cannot donate a proton out of their nucleus, because that changes physically and literally what they are in the world of chemistry. That is sort of our one absolute rule. Number of protons in the nucleus defines the element and it cannot be changed. So how does proton donation and acceptance occur? Should be a question that, that we have to wrestle with, okay? So uh, an atom like carbon, again, has six protons and normally six neutrons, and then six electrons, all right? This cannot lose or gain electrons, okay? without changing its identity. So, I guess nothing can happen. There is one element, though, that is a little different in this regard from all other elements, in that it has only one proton. A hydrogen atom has one proton in its nucleus, and one electron outside of it. If I could take away the electron, what would be left is the, that's the hydrogen nucleus, right? Which has just one proton, but it's also a hydrogen ion, H1 plus. So the term proton is uh, sort of sneaky in that when we say a, a substance gains or lose a pro loses a proton, we're really talking about a hydrogen ion like this, all right? So synonymous with proton from now on is the hydrogen ion, H plus ion. Okay. And how this would happen is in a substance like hydrochloric acid, in HCl, the electron of hydrogen gets pulled into the, towards the chlorine. If we can then sever that bond, we have a chlorine ion, because it has the extra electron that was hydrogens, and we have our H plus ion which can now be donated. Okay. So this is sort of how protons can be donated uh, and conversely accepted in a similar manner from substances. When uh, the more electronegative half of a molecule is able to draw to itself the electron of hydrogen, that leaves the proton, the nucleus of the hydrogen, able to be sort of released or donated away, all right? And that is the action 
associated with being an acid. Something else, if it were negatively charged, hanging around, would then be attracted to this very positive proton and would choose to bond with it. That's going to be the base side of, of this scenario as well. Okay? So this is how we justify donating and accepting of protons in, in a chemical setting. Right? Any questions on, on that? So it's really important that you, again, the take home message here is that a proton is really a hydrogen ion, an H plus. That, so an H that has lost or left behind its electron. So when we consider this definition then, it expands the group of compounds that can be considered acids or bases from that very narrow starting point of the Arrhenius acids and bases to now our Bronsted-Lowry compounds. So, some examples of Bronsted-Lowry acids. Well, everything that was an Arrhenius acid would still be a Bronsted-Lowry acid. If you look back to what we had written a, minute, a few minutes ago, they all have an H on them as the cation. So pretty much anything that has H as its cation is capable of donating that uh, and is going to be an acid. So HCl, H2SO4, there's a few others listed on the, the sheet that I've, uh, the handout sheet to accompany the lecture today as well. Right? But now also some more diverse or interesting compounds. The ammonium cation, NH4+, has an abundance of hydrogen and it has a positive charge, which, isn't, which is not ideal. You know, ideally, things want to be neutrally charged. So this is the perfect setup. If we eliminate a hydrogen with a positive charge going away from it, we achieve a neutral charge on what's left behind. That's why this will act very nicely as an acid for us as well. Right? Um, H2PO4 minus and even HPO4 2 minus. So anything that has a hydrogen as its cation again is going to be capable of being an acid. This is not an exhaustive list, certainly. Okay? Um, and then a, a very interesting group of compounds, aluminum ions in water. When aluminum is put into water, it forms what we call a complex that would be written this way. And we'll see this uh, a little bit more later in the chapter. The aluminum atom forms a relationship with six water molecules because it's highly charged, highly positive, right? And the water molecules, the negative side of the oxygens, are strongly attracted to that positive uh, aluminum ion. And six of them can get close to it in an octahedral geometry, left, right, top, bottom, front, and back, if I was the aluminum uh, ion. Right? And so that's what this complex is. And those waters choose to literally hang on to the aluminum. This now creates a, a thing that we call a complex that has a whole bunch of hydrogen atoms in it all right, that are going to be able to be donated away to, to other things if we need to. So there are several metals, we'll see them uh, in subsequent lectures, that are capable to do this and are able to act like acids then. Okay. So those are uh, some additional things that are considered acids under the Bronsted-Lowry definition. On the base side is where we really see an increase in the number of compounds. We were very limited in the Arrhenius definition 
to hydroxides and oxides. But now, uh, those things would still be uh, considered bases, like Li2O, NaOH, mainly in that case because of the OH minus. All right? So it's actually OH minus that acts as the base. But now, additionally, <coughs> most compounds that have nitrogen in them act as a base. Okay? Again, because of the nitrogen, we'll see this later on too. Today's uh, segment just sort of sets the stage for what's an acid and a base. That's a lone pair of electrons on that nitrogen atom because of its bonding structure. That lone pair of electrons is able to draw and attach to that proton that we're talking about. So it's able to accept positive charge to that negative you know, group of electrons there. So that's why many nitrogen complexes and compounds act as bases. Some other things. Uh, most ions that have a negative charge, so I've already got OH minus, but the cyanide ion, okay? And many of your polyatomic ions, when they've been stripped of all of their, it's going to be three minus, all of their hydrogens, they are going to be bases as well, okay? Because they have these negative charges that want to attract positive hydrogens to themselves. But interestingly, There's this whole group of compounds that are in both sets, okay? We have many compounds that are capable of acting as both an acid or a base, okay? Many substances. Many substances can act as either an acid or a base. How will we know is the big question. How will we know which way they act? Okay. The short answer comes back to the analogy that I used earlier. How do I know if you, as the student, are going to be quiet and attentive or loud and rowdy? It was your surroundings, right? The setting in which I placed you. In class, you're the quiet, attentive student, but at a basketball game or a soccer game, you're the loud, cheering, rowdy student, okay? And so the, we need to know about the surroundings and the other substances that are near our substance of interest to decide how it will act and how it will behave. So that's the short answer, okay? The surroundings dictate this. Okay, I'm going to wrap up the first segment of our uh, acid-base chemistry at this point, and so the video is going to, going to shut off for a moment here. Yeah.